and I'm really pleased to uh, host or to chair today's uh, Wednesday seminar. To start with, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to extend that respect to the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander people that are present today online and in the room today. The um, seminar that you're attending today is called Space Weather and Its Impacts, and it will be talking about numerical modeling from the sun to earth. And that's a very uh, topic with that which has a lot of interest at the moment. So we're very pleased to have the two speakers to tell us more about that. The two speakers today come from UNSW and the Space Department in Canberra. Uh, Dr. Melrose Brown leads the numerical space situational awareness research capability at UNSW, and he's also the uh, program coordinator for the Space Masters. So he himself holds a master and a PhD in aerospace engineering. And previously, he was responsible for the numerical simulation and analysis of the Scram Space hypersonic flight vehicle, which is surely the best words to use in any introduction of anybody. And he was heavily involved with the vehicle's design, construction, testing, and launch. Since joining UNSW, uh, Melrose has sought to apply the same coupling of high fidelity numerical simulations with ground and flying tests to study the complex interaction between satellites and the space environment. And then the second speaker today is Dr. George Bowden. Um, George has research experience in several fields of physics relating to fluids and plasmas, and he has a PhD in physics for work on numerical modeling of waves in ideal magnetohydrodynamic fusion plasmas. Again, great words. Later postdoctoral research has involved computational fluid dynamic, uh, dynamic modeling of upper atmosphere and particularly in the coupled ionosphere and thermosphere systems. This work has been motivated by applications in astrodynamics, particularly around satellite drag and space weather prediction, including natural and anthropogenic phenomena. So with this very distinguished set of lectures, I really look forward to hearing more about space weather and its impacts and how we might understand more about that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that very warm welcome. Um, I'm very much the warm-up act. Um, George is the main um, the main event today. I, I really wanted to um, try and put some of the space weather in the context of space domain awareness and also flag how it connects to some of our, our broader research around our small satellite um, missions that we design, develop and, and fly and also our space domain awareness um, research more broadly. So why are we interested in space domain awareness and how space weather connects with it at all? Well, if you, if you read any of the popular media, congested, contested and competitive is the, the kind of buzzwords that's used to describe how the space environment is changing. So congested means that we're launching more and more things into orbit at an ever increasing rate. So the um, important orbital planes are having more and more objects in them. Um, contested really speaks to the um, changing strategic use of space. So not only are we seeing uh, more objects go up there, but we're seeing more um, competition between some of these um, large powers, America, Russia, um, China, for the, um, for the use of that space. So a few years ago, we always spoke about space situational awareness. Now space domain awareness has become the term that we use. That is in um, direct response to um, some of these countries um, defining space as a war fighting domain. So it changes the, um, the kind of outlook quite significantly. And then finally, competitive, um, that speaks to the changing um, commercial use of space. So um, as of today, there are um, 20,000 objects in orbit, which are displayed here. Only about 2,000 of those are actually active satellites. Um, a decade or two ago, the majority of those were government and defense owned. But nowadays, um, I think just over 50% of those are now commercially owned. And with things like Star, Starlink and, and OneWeb, um, by the end of this decade, we should have between 20,000 to 100,000 active satellites 
with the vast majority of those being commercially owned. So this places strain on the orbital resources um, and it also changes the makeup of who's using space and why they're, why they're using it. Um, another important thing to note is that um, aside from the increase in the things we're launching in space, um, there's a whole population of small objects um, that we currently can't see. So this graph shows you um, the, the, the purple stuff is the, um, the correlated observations. So that's from, I believe, the Space Surveillance Telescope, um, an image uh, a data taken from one night. So the correlated objects are things that we um, I have seen and we're able to track and they're in the catalog. The red objects are uncorrelated objects. So there was a detection, a bit like a fly hitting your um, windscreen. You knew that it hit your windscreen, but you don't know what it was, where it was coming from and all of that. Um, as you progress to the right hand side of the um, graph, the sensitivity of the, the bounds of the sensitivity of the sensor are reached. So it looks like that drops off, but in reality, you're just unable to detect those objects. Um, where space weather comes into this is that to be able to um, detect these objects and to be able to tell where they're going so that they don't, so we can move our active satellites out the way of these potentially destructive bits of space debris, um, we, we really need to understand the physical mechanisms behind how they, they interact with space weather. So smaller a uh, body is and the higher the area to mass ratio is, the more they're affected by space weather. So they can blow around in the wind a bit like a, a plastic bag compared to a, a satellite that's a bit more like a brick flying through the, the atmosphere. So just detecting them isn't enough. We need to be able to understand where they're going to be in the future. And space weather and space environment research is really important um, to be able to make those accurate predictions so we can get out of the way of these things in the future. Um, our specific research that we do at UNSW Canberra, so just over the hill there, um, is largely captured on these three pillars. We've got astrodynamics, space environment research, which is the focus of today's talk, and space surveillance. All three of these pillars, um, they're, they're interconnected. You can't really do one without the other. So um, to tie all of these elements together, we've got um, various bits of technology. So um, that's what's in the yellow boxes. We've got um, machine learning and, and different telescopes and things. But the main thing I'll draw your attention to is our on-orbit small satellite missions. So we design, develop, integrate, um, and operate our own um, satellite missions. And we use these as a truth source so that we can calibrate and benchmark our space domain awareness uh, sensors and simulations. The impact of the space environment on how you do SSA and space domain awareness is quite complex and nuanced, and I won't go into too much detail, but I thought I'd flag kind of four main aspects that are um, important to consider. So space traffic management, that comes down to what we were just talking about, trying to understand where and when um, your space objects are going to be into the future. For low Earth orbit, the, um, the uh, satellite drag is the main uncertainty in, in that position. As you go up higher, you start having other effects such as solar radiation pressure, which can perturb your satellite orbits. Um, communications, it's, um, it's you know, well known that irregularities in the ionosphere can disrupt your communications that can um, be quite um, problematic for a range of space applications, um, but also damage to spacecraft. So it's not just being hit by bits of space debris that can cause you problems. The space environment itself is quite a, um, quite a harsh environment. So there's radiation, there's atomic oxygen, um, single event upsets. So all of these things can um, degrade the ability of your spacecraft to do its job. And then the final one down the bottom there, that really speaks to the um, more of the military side of space domain awareness. So as we were talking about, space is becoming a, a contested domain. And if you have a military satellite that suffers a, um, an anomaly or an outage, um, people really want to know whether that was someone intentionally in interfering with their spacecraft or whether it was a um, space environment effect. And currently our ability to be able to separate those effects out is um, pretty poor at, at best. 
Um, a little bit about our group. Um, we have um, designed and launched a number of um, spacecrafts, starting with the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission back in 2017, which is on the left-hand side of your slide. Um, and then through a series of um, uh, different funding rounds, we've, we've got to where we are today, which is um, M2 on the right-hand side that we launched on the 22nd of March um, this year. Um, space domain awareness and space environment modeling is, is central to a lot of the experiments that we run on these, and I'll, I'll flesh out one or two of those in the next couple of slides. So the M2 mission, um, it's funded by the Royal Australian um, Air Force, and it's a pair of um, six U CubeSats. They start life as a conjoined pair, so it's a 12U box, about that big. Um, and then at some point in the next few weeks, we're going to tell these things to separate into two 6U CubeSats, deploy some solar panels, um, and start doing lots of fun things. So we've developed um, pretty much all of the systems on board. We've got imagers, we've got um, a, a, a number of computers and onboard programming. Uh, but for the interest of this talk, um, the aerodynamic controlled formation flying is a is a key technology we're looking to prove where we use the neutral atmosphere and the uh, changes in the spacecraft attitude to um, control the relative position to each other um, and also our, our ionospheric aerodynamics experiment this is where we charge the spacecraft up and they interact with the ionosphere in ways that are um, not generally um, considered in um, in most analyses. So you've got a, a neutral drag effect, but on top of that, um, if your spacecraft sitting at a charge, there's an additional um, impact with the um, ionosphere. So we're doing lots of things with these spacecraft. There's lots of tech demonstrations, but we're also doing some fundamental science into space domain awareness and also space environment research. I'll press that button again. Okay, here we go. So this is a um, an artist's impression of what that separation is going to look like. If it will please to play for me. There we go. Um, so this isn't um, 100% physically accurate. So if you see a couple of um, antennas looking like they might um, come quite close to each other, it, it, this is just an artist's impression. But this is a 12 cube set. Um, and it's currently in that conjoined configuration. We are going to separate this in um, a, a few weeks' time, and we're um, really drawing on a lot of um, uh, George's space environment um, modeling research to support this, along with the astrodynamics and all of the space domain awareness sensors that we're going to bring to bear. So uh, it separates with the spring, and that's what you see here, and then we open these quite large panels. Those yellow bits on the end, those are our charge panels to do the ionospheric aerodynamics experiment um, later in the mission. So that's um, uh, towards the end of the mission. But um, right up front, we need to start doing some formation flying. So this one that's turning here is going to go into its high drag configurations. It sees more drag, drops in altitude, and um, it, it moves relative to the other spacecraft. And then if you reverse that, you, you reverse the effect. Um, the orbital mechanics a little bit complicated, so it's um, it requires a bit of phasing to do this well. And it also requires quite a lot of um, a operations workflows to be able to get the data down and um, and couple everything together. Uh, um, so to um, wrap up and, and hand over to George in just a second. Um, Understanding the state of the thermosphere and ionosphere is very important if we want to do space traffic management and space domain awareness well. It's one of the major uncertainties in knowing where spacecraft are. If we don't know where they are, we can't manage them. Um, traditionally, space environment modeling and space domain awareness have been very separate fields. And what we're trying to do is, is really intertwine these. So for our particular space missions, um, space environment modeling and astrodynamics and space situation awareness, we tried to treat these as, as one as much as we possibly can. So right at the start of the design of our experiments and all of our workflows, we're trying to consider these um, elements as much as possible. A lot of this is quite um, a new and very much based in research, but we're hoping by the end of this mission, we will have um, established um, a significant amount of space environment research into our operational workflows. And that will be enough from me, I think. I'll hand over to George. Uh, 
thank you very much, Melrose. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to give a fairly broad overview of space weather um, and some of its impacts, as well as highlighting specific research that I'm uh, currently doing. So in terms of definition, um, space weather generally refers to variations in the space environment uh, between the sun and the earth. So that, that space environment is taken to include uh, the sun, the heliosphere, which is the region uh, dominated by the solar wind, the earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, and mesosphere. In this region, the main source of variability, the main source of space weather is the sun. Variations on the sun, which I'll describe later in the presentation, uh, cause uh, changes in this environment. However, there are additional and significant uh, changes, variability, uh, due to terrestrial sources, as well as anthropogenic sources. The um, space weather uh, affects uh, human activity through its impacts on both space and ground-based technologies. These include impacts on spacecraft, including charging, radiation and drag, satellite position, navigation and timing, its effects on electricity grids, as well as uh, radio propagation for communications and radar. So in this presentation, I'm going to start out uh, talking giving a brief overview of the ionosphere thermosphere system, uh, talk about how changes in the sun impact that system. Uh, also mention some ways in which uh, terrestrial and lower atmospheric phenomena can affect the ionosphere thermosphere system. Then talk about some anthropogenic uh, causes of variability in the ionosphere and thermosphere before uh, talking about how space-based technologies are affected by space weather. So the ionosphere thermosphere system is a complex system. It's got a number of different inputs that uh, drive and determine its state and uh, various phenomena at various uh, length and time scales uh, within that system. The thermosphere uh, constitutes the region of the neutral atmosphere above the mesopause, which is the temperature minimum in the atmosphere, and the exobase, where the fluid approximation breaks down. The atmosphere can no longer be considered a fluid above that uh, point. Typically, this uh, extends between 95 and 500 kilometres in altitude, but that varies with solar and geomagnetic activity. Gravity causes a stratification in the composition uh, in this region of the atmosphere, so that in the lower thermosphere, uh, diatomic oxygen and nitrogen are dominant species, uh, followed by uh, monatomic oxygen and nitrogen uh, higher in the atmosphere where satellites typically orbit, and then uh, higher still, uh, helium and hydrogen become dominant. The primary source of energy for the thermosphere is uh, EUV radiation from the sun. This is absorbed through various uh, processes. Uh, but dual heating, which is heating due to induced currents in the uh, thermosphere and uh, particle precipitation, uh, can also be significant sources of energy at the higher latitudes. There are periodic variations in the thermosphere state, uh, which occur due to atmospheric tides, which are predominantly due to the uh, EUV heating, uh, just following the sun around the earth. Uh, there are additional non-migrating tides uh, or other migrating tides uh, due to the gravitational fields of the moon and the sun. Uh, the differential heating results in high speed uh, winds in the neutral atmosphere, which are typically between one and 300 
meters per second. All of this is shown in the animation on the right hand side of the slide. There are longer period uh, changes in the uh, thermosphere, uh, which occur due to changes in the orientation of the Earth with respect to the um, solar wind and with respect to incoming solar radiation as well. This uh, variability, this sort of climatological variability in the uh, thermosphere can be described using empirical models. These models uh, represent uh, functions that are functions of local time, latitude, altitude, uh, solar and geomagnetic indices fitted to empirical data, which comes from a range of sources. There are a number of uh, different uh, m empirical models that are in use at the moment and their use uh, depends mm -hmm. on the application and its computational uh, and accuracy requirements. Uh, one particular model I draw attention to is the EMSIS model, which is uh, widely used and used in my research. Moving on to the ionosphere. Uh, the ionosphere is a uh, plasma which uh, results from the uh, weekly weak ionization of the mesosphere and thermosphere predominantly due to absorption of uh, that uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun. It's important because it um, reflects, refracts and delays the signals uh, used in HF uh, communications and radar, as well as uh, GPS measurements. Uh, the dominant model, empirical model of the ionosphere uh, is the IRI model, which takes uh, solar ionospheric and geomagnetic indices and uh, provides uh, density, electron temperature, ion density, ion temperature, all of these parameters for specified locations uh, in the ionosphere. It's been under development for several decades. An example of model output is uh, shown on the right hand side of this slide. In addition to the empirical models that I've talked about, uh, it's also possible to describe the ionosphere thermosphere system using uh, physics based, mo based models. In particular, general circulation models uh, solve coupled thermodynamic and fluid equations for multiple species with couplings and source terms representing the various physical and chemical processes going on in the upper atmosphere, such as radiation absorption, collisions, chemistry, etc. Examples of this type of model include uh, Thai GCM, the Thermosphere Ionosphere Electrodynamics General Circulation Model, WACMX, and uh, GITM, the Global Ionosphere Thermosphere Model. These are computationally demanding parallelized codes. While they don't currently demonstrate a clear advantage in terms of accuracy over the empirical models, which simply de describe climatology of the ionosphere thermosphere system, they do provide a greater insight into the uh, underlying physics of these regions. Moving out from the ionosphere, we have the magnetosphere, which is a comet-shaped region with, dominated by the Earth's magnetic field. So its boundary is that between the solar wind and the region uh, dominated by the sun's magnetic field and that dominated by the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, solar wind impinging upon this region produces a bow shock. Uh, solar wind is heated and deflected uh, in the magneto sheath and uh, the magneto pores, the inner boundary of that magneto sheath, uh, separates the solar wind from plasma confined in the magnetosphere. Solar wind can enter through the polar cusps and the plasma sheet. Charged particles follow magnetic field lines into high latitude, the high latitude thermosphere, forming auroral ovals, depositing energy into the thermosphere. 
uh, within the magnetosphere are the radiation belts and the ring current. So energetic particles can be trapped along closed magnetic field lines through the magnetic mirror effect. This results in inner, outer, and sometimes transient third radiation belts, the so-called Van Allen radiation belts. There's also a ring current consisting of uh, lower energy uh, particles drifting azimuthly around the Earth. So having described uh, the ionosphere and thermosphere, we move on to the sun and uh, the impacts that the sun has on the ionosphere thermosphere system. The sun uh, contains the rotating convective and conducting plasma, which generates a complicated magnetic field as shown in the right hand side of this slide uh, through a dynamo process. Twisted magnetic field lines store up uh, energy, which can then be released in the corona, heating it to extreme temperatures much higher than the underlying photosphere. This causes the corona to emit uh, EUV radiation due to uh, line emissions in the uh, atoms there. Uh, magnetic activity. Uh, the sun's magnetic field undergoes polarity reversals on the, over the course of 11-year solar cycles, which modulate the magnetic activity of the sun, modulating the temperatures, the state of the corona, and thus EUV emissions. So whilst the sun in visible light is a very constant uh, emit emitter, the EUV emissions are very wildly over the course of the solar cycle, and due to transient phenomena on much shorter time scales. This uh, affects the thermosphere, uh, which expands at solar maximum and contracts at solar minimum. The sun uh, has active regions where there are dense uh, closed magnetic field lines appearing as bright spots on uh, X-ray uh, images. The, some active regions are shown uh, on this slide. Sunspots are often present in these regions and prominences and loops can occur. These active regions can give rise to solar flares, uh, which are explosions uh, occurring due to uh, magnetic reconnection uh, leading to flashes of EUV radiation or X-rays. So an example is shown on the far right of the sun in this picture. These are most frequent at the solar maximum. Solar flares cause moderate uh, expansion of the thermosphere and significantly enhance the ionisation of the D region of the ionosphere. Uh, the sun emits a steady stream of plasma uh, into the heliosphere. The heliosphere is a kind of magnetic bubble in uh, uh, interstellar space that uh, is dominated by the sun's uh, magnetic field, where the this solar wind. The solar wind is not a constant speed, and sometimes higher speed solar wind catches up with slower speed solar wind uh, to cause uh, co-rotating interaction regions where shocks can occur, sudden changes in uh, magnetic field. The sun also can erupt uh, with uh, large amounts of plasma being deposited into launched into the heliosphere in coronal mass ejections. These occur due to uh, magnetic reconnection. The changes in the, sorry, the uh, animation on this uh, slide shows the effect of coronal mass ejections uh, on the inner heliosphere. That is the region uh, within the Earth's orbit. 
changes in the uh, magnetic field uh, density and uh, speed uh, can cause uh, geomagnetic storms uh, when the, uh, these co-rotating interaction regions or coronal mass ejections impact the magnetosphere. Typically, the most extreme geomagnetic storms are caused by CMEs. Uh, however, CIRs can also have a significant effect uh, because they last over longer period of time, periods of time. So the animation on the right shows the effect of a geomagnetic storm of a coronal mass ejection causing a geomagnetic storm on the Earth's magnetosphere. During the initial phase of the storm, uh, a discontinuity compresses the magnetosphere. This leads to uh, energy being coupled into the magnetosphere, increasing the ring current, changing uh, magnetic fields at the Earth's surface. Uh, this eventually subsides when the uh, coronal mass ejection or CIR passes and the uh, ring current uh, gradually recovers and the magnetosphere returns to normal. During a um, geomagnetic storm, there's increased uh, precipitation of energetic particles into the, the aurora and uh, currents uh, cause dual heating at high latitudes. The high latitude uh, thermosphere expands and uh, carries uh, atmospheric disturbances towards the equator. Moreover, um, the uh, ionosphere is affected because uh, pl plasma is driven to higher altitudes by the uh, motion of the neutral atmosphere. And uh, this causes a positive ionospheric effect, which is followed by a negative ionospheric effect later on as uh, nitrogen wells up in the atmosphere to higher altitudes and causes a depletion of the ionosphere. Uh, nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen promotes recombination. There are also substorms which occur due to reconnection in the magneto tail, uh, which accelerates uh, charged particles, causing the aurora to brighten and uh, disturbing magnetic fields at high latitudes. Moving on to some of my research, uh, I'm interested in trying to uh, predict to forecast the state of the ionosphere thermosphere system in order to better predict uh, drag on satellites. So the, in order to do this, I want to uh, better estimate uh, the state based on the data, uh, thermosphere data that exists as well as the physical models. So combining those two things in order to provide the best available estimate of the thermosphere state. Data for the thermosphere uh, tend to be sparse, um, but they do come from a range of different sources. There are satellite accelerometers and measurements of satellite orbital decay, which uh, measure uh, densities along an orbital track. There are also a small number of uh, UV spectrographs which observe the state of the thermosphere. There are ground-based measurements of infrared airglow and there's measurements from a small number of incoherent scatter radars which can infer oxygen density. The question is how to combine the data to obtain the best available estimate uh, of the thermosphere state. The approach I'm looking at is uh, on ensemble Kalman filtering. So a Kalman filter is a type of uh, recursive Bayesian filter where the estimates of uncertainty and state are changed, uh, are updated as more data becomes available. The ensemble Kalman filter variant uh, is a Monte Carlo method uh, where the probability distribution is represented using an ensemble. So you start with an ensemble of uh, models, um, in this case, uh, TIGCM 
models of the thermosphere, each in a range of different possible states of the thermosphere. Then a prediction step follows where the uh, models are advanced in time and the mean and covariance of the ensemble is updated. Then observations are included in an analysis step uh, where we update each ensemble member to reflect the best estimate of the sample mean and covariance based on the previous state and of the ensemble and the new date, the new data that we're assimilating. Adjustments can be made either uh, deterministically or through random perturbations to observations. I've used the data assimilation research testbed in order to uh, implement the ensemble Kalman filtering scheme. This uh, set of uh, software tools uh, interfaces with uh, many different atmospheric models and uh, with many observational data sets. And it's reasonably straightforward to add new ones. There are a number of options included uh, which are needed to actually make this scheme work in practice uh, for localization and inflation. Uh, DART also supports uh, parallel parallelization of the codes. So in the particular case that uh, I've looked at, uh, it was a, an ionosphere, thermosphere, sorry, it was a storm, geomagnetic storm occurring in 2018. The KP profile for this storm is shown on this slide. I used um, TIGCM assimilating data from the gold in instrument, which is a spectrograph on the commercial SES-14 geostationary satellite. The observations cover um, a wide area of the Earth's surface beneath this geostationary satellite while it's illuminated by the sun. So this animation shows the results of that simulation showing how data is assimilated to update the model state um, for that storm. It's clearly seen that the observations occurring around the Atlantic uh, are increasing, uh, increasing the estimated temperature. However, um, it's also noted that uh, because of the nature of the ionosphere thermosphere system, which has a relatively short memory, these changes are not persisting for very long. In future work, I would like to um, consider uh, changing not just the model states, but the model inputs uh, based on data assimilation. So changing the indices that are being fed into the TIE GCM simulations. So although the sun is the dominant driver of space weather, there are also effects on the ionosphere thermosphere system originating from lowering the atmosphere. Atmospheric waves um, can originate from the lower atmosphere. These include atmospheric gravity waves, which rep uh, represent an effect of uh, buoyancy. Typically, these have uh, periods of five to 60 minutes and velocities of 100 to 300 metres per second. You can also have uh, long wavelength acoustic waves, infrasound, uh, propagating up from the troposphere into the thermosphere. Where um, frequency is similar to the buoyancy frequency, the Grant Fasala frequency, the, um, you get essentially a hybrid of uh, acoustic and gravity waves, sort of acoustic gravity waves. The dispersion uh, relation for these waves has two branches representing an acoustic branch and a gravity wave branch, as shown on the right of this slide. 
So there are many sources of acoustic and gravity waves. These include constant sources like um, sea surface waves and uh, the flow of air over uh, mountain ranges, the so-called orographic uh, gravity waves. There are also uh, transient effects such as thunderstorms, cyclones, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanoes which uh, cause uh, gravity waves or infrasound. These waves can propagate, as mentioned, to the thermosphere and ionosphere. As they increase in altitude, they increase in amplitude. Eventually, um, these waves will break as sufficiently high altitudes, um, affecting the uh, mesosphere and lower thermosphere. They can transfer energy and momentum uh, to these systems and are indeed uh, important sources of uh, energy and momentum. They can also result in secondary gravity waves uh, rising, which propagate to even higher altitudes, uh, causing uh, variations in uh, density. These uh, waves uh, impact the ionosphere, they cause uh, travelling ionospheric disturbances. Ion neutral collisions result in the uh, pl ionosphere plasma being dragged up and down magnetic uh, field lines uh, by these uh, collisions with ion, ions, between ions and neutrals. It's uh, possible for human activity to uh, impact the ionosphere thermosphere system as well. There are various ways in which this can happen. Briefly, uh, via VLF uh, radiation, VLF pollution uh, disturbs uh, trapped uh, electrons in the magnetosphere, modifying their population. There are deliberate uh, changes to the ionosphere by instruments like uh, HARP, where the ionosphere is heated by uh, HF radio waves. The, uh, ions it has been suggested that the ionosphere structure has been modified uh, through climate change, through changes in uh, temperatures of the neutral atmosphere. Moreover, uh, large artificial explosions um, can cause uh, travelling atmospheric disturbances. And a recent example being the uh, 2020 Beirut explosion, uh, which uh, produced uh, measurable changes in the ionosphere. Moving to an area of particular interest to my research, uh, rocket launches can affect the ionosphere. This occurs through two different uh, mechanisms, uh, through a chemical and atmospheric wave mechanisms. In the former case, um, the second stage of a rocket uh, launching to orbit uh, can deposit uh, uh, chemicals into the uh, thermosphere, which undergo rapid uh, charge exchange and recombination uh, with the species present. Uh, examples shown here, so they deplete the O plus ions which are dominant in the F region of the ionosphere. Acoustic and gravity waves are uh, generated through the interaction of the expanding exhaust plume with the thermosphere. And so these produce uh, effects similar to those uh, travelling ionospheric disturbances uh, mentioned for those mentioned pre previously. You get um, ion compression and rarefaction due to the uh, perturbations to neutral winds and ion neutral collisions. Also, as the ions are driven to higher or lower altitude, altitudes, changes in loss in production, which also impact ionisation. And uh, finally, there's an electrodynamic effect where 
uh, polarization electric fields are transmitted along magnetic field lines from lower altitudes to higher altitudes. These are interesting as um, a kind of way to use the ionosphere as a sensor to detect rocket launches, as well as a potential way to uh, measure the atmospheric state and to test our models of the ionosphere thermosphere system. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my place. Okay, so in the first instance, to model the uh, depletion of uh, the ionosphere due to um, rocket launches, I, I've modified a general circulation model called GITM uh, to include source and continuity, source terms in the continuity and energy equations. Uh, to represent those charge exchange and recombination reactions. I model the uh, initial diffusion of the exhaust plume on subgrid scales analytically, and then add this to GITM. I use an approximate rocket trajectory uh, determined uh, using speed and altitude data and sorry, just including the animation. This um, allows this me to reproduce the uh, depletions, uh, an example shown on the right of this slide uh, for a recent launch of an electron rocket uh, by Rocket Labs from New Zealand. So, sorry, the animation's not looping. Um, yeah, so the I find that uh, this approach uh, reproduces the size and uh, movement of uh, depletions relatively well, um, as well as the qualitative dependence on the of the depletion on rocket trajectory. Moving on to the uh, wave effects, the simulate. I simulate these using a ray tracing model, assuming that uh, the uh, sound wavelength, the length of these acoustic waves, is much shorter than the scale of changes in the uh, sound speed, as well as uh, mean free path. I've derived a system of equations in spherical coordinates to describe uh, these rays um, and solved uh, numerically. Uh, in order to, uh, using a background atmosphere from EMSIS and uh, determined uh, changes in velocity and pressure along these rays. Uh, this approach is reasonably successful at determining those uh, changes. However, it uh, faces challenges in terms of uh, subsequently determining how those affect the ionosphere in order to accurately represent the ionosphere-thermosphere coupling, I've moved to using a general circulation model. I've added a, an acoustic uh, monopole source to GITM, resulting in uh, the simulation shown here. The exhaust uh, plume uh, dimensions are modeling, modeled as previously. Uh, and that is analytically, and source amplitudes are derived through uh, equating the monopole and analytic uh, plume acoustic energy fluxes. Uh, a comparison of uh, model of ray tracing uh, GITM and uh, GPS measurements is shown on this slide. We see that the um, qualitative uh, as aspects of the uh, rocket 
travelling ionospheric disturbances are reproduced. You have initial high-speed acoustic waves uh, causing the disturbances, followed by uh, circular uh, travelling ionospheric disturbances uh, at uh, decreasing phase velocities. Uh, the final part of this talk, I move on to the impact of uh, space weather on space-based technologies. So uh, space weather can impact uh, spacecraft communications. Uh, geomagnetic storms uh, modify the ionosphere, causing at various times positive and negative changes in total electron content, as well as uh, gradients in this quantity. It modifies the paths taken by radio and radar signals, which can affect uh, your estimates of uh, satellite positions. It uh, alters uh, polarisation of radio signals uh, through Faraday rotation, which is important for communications. And uh, it also disrupts uh, GNSS uh, navigation. Uh, solar flares are well known to increase deregion ionisation, which causes absorption of HF radio communications. This uh, leads to so-called blackouts. An example of um, the regions affected by a particular blackout are shown on the right-hand side. Uh, space weather can also lead to changes in the spacecraft radiation environment. Electrons and ions can be accelerated uh, through solar flares and uh, by shocks formed by CMEs. Uh, satellites in high, high orbits are most vulnerable to these. You can get electric charging of uh, spacecraft due to the flux of radiation. Uh, deep dielectric charging can be a cause of failure for spacecraft electronic components. Likewise, X-rays originally originating from solar flares can damage uh, spacecraft electronics. Satellite drag, which is a major focus of my research, um, is also significantly affected by space weather, particularly by geomagnetic storms, uh, which cause these density uh, disturbances originating from the high latitude regions which propagate uh, down towards the equator. Upper atmospheric density can more than double, which causes uh, significant problems for spacecraft tracking, which will increase your risk of collisions and cause uncertainty for things like the re-entry location. The example on the right-hand side shows the aftermath of a particularly large geomagnetic storm, which caused uh, the satellite tracking to be lost for a very large number of uh, satellites. Similar but much smaller effects can occur due to substorms as well as solar flares. In order to better predict uh, the densities for particular satellites, I've been looking into an approach of localised density estimation. So the idea is to uh, determine uh, or forecast thermosphere densities along the orbit of a particular satellite. Um, this uh, approach goes back to uh, work by Stastny and Perez. I've been training neural networks in order to predict uh, density based on uh, time series of prior density measurements, as well as indices, including the uh, solar flux in index, F10.7, which is uh, a major which basically reflects the energy input into the thermosphere, and uh, AP, which is the geomagnetic activity index. Uh, network architecture and the uh, results, some results, preliminary results are shown on the right. I've also looked at using neural networks to calibrate uh, forecasts from different models. So to develop a weighted uh, average, essentially, in order to determine 
uh, best the density based on the predictions of several different models. Um, I first apply principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of inputs and out outputs and train a long, -term, long short term memory um, network uh, on time series of the uh, principal component scores, uh, solar flux and uh, geomagnetic index indices. Uh, as well as uh, the local time of the ascending node, which uh, sort of defines the changes in, in the orbit. I'll leave you with this slide, which uh, represents some of the challenge uh, associated with modelling space weather. As you can see, uh, space weather consists of uh, many interconnected uh, physical phenomena occurring at a range of different uh, time scales and dispersed in space. So thanks very much for your time. That's the end of the thanks very much, both our speakers, for a very interesting um, incredible amount of uh, information that helps us understand space weather and its impacts. And uh, I don't know if everybody's aware of that, but these events really, uh, as you ended up in your slide, the impact of these events can be felt not even below the level of the satellites. I think it was a major blackout in Canada in 89. Is that the same event as you showed earlier? Yes, that might. Right. Yeah. So the whole uh, whole swaths of a country can be without power, just as an effect of, of exactly these events that uh, we heard about today. Uh, I realise it's a bit late, so acknowledging that some people may have to leave, I want to give uh, opportunity for questions. In fact, one of the people who have to leave are the speakers. But there is a little bit of time for some questions. So uh, are there any questions that people want to ask? Anand. Yes, so uh, that brings us to a couple of different aspects of research um, that my colleagues are doing. So one of the things that we're looking at is uh, passive control of uh, satellite formations. So that's where uh, I think Melrose alluded to it. The, uh, you change the profile that the satellites are showing uh, in their orbits and uh, use the aerodynamic forces on those satellites to modify their orbits over time. Uh, there's another strain of research uh, that's been looking at this uh, neglected, um, often neglected uh, forces on satellites, which are due to the ionosphere. So the ionosphere um, can cause a force on satellites, uh, quite complicated, um, it's quite a complicated phenomenon because the satellite uh, has basically charges and acquires a potential while in orbit and or it can be actively charged as our experiment uh, aims to do and that those forces um, the uh, resulting uh, interactions of the uh, ionosphere plasma and the that charged satellite result in um, forces which could potentially be used to uh, control the uh, satellite uh, control the satellite orbit as well I'll um, offer Melrose the opportunity to elaborate if he wants. That's pretty pretty accurate. Um, yeah, the, the ionospheric aerodynamic interaction um, is a lot more complex than the tool one. Um, a plasma sheet can then get behind the um, body and the electron structure, which 
Then I did stop capturing the idle, so it's harder to look at, and that's um, yeah, where, where some of the problems go away. Then in space, we also had a uh, go of trying to do it, trying to sweat out and see vacuum chambers as well. It's not as easy as making them work. Thanks. Um, Jack? Yeah. Um, well, I think you mentioned briefly. Um, I know there's been a couple of papers published recently in this direction, but they're essentially retrospective really are the best of the ones. Would you be able to comment on the potential to take off of operational providers these technologies in real time to? Yes, um, I think that it's certainly possible and indeed I, I haven't um, looked into it in a great deal of detail, but I think there have been, it, uh, people are at least looking at operationalising this. It's uh, certainly possible to gather these measurements of the ionosphere in real time. Uh, there's a large network of ionospheric sensors in terms of uh, GPS ground stations, which can be used for this, although um, potentially these are not, um, uh, don't give great coverage of the oceans. So it may be somewhat limited in terms of uh, tsunami detection for that reason. I think we'll go to our final question. Um, Jack, you Should be on the phone. Well, we'll leave it there unless anyone has any burning questions. Then I'll just thank our speakers again for a very illuminating talk. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll talk about next week's talk, which is uh, also hosted by the ATI program. And we'll talk about positioning Australia program and it's highlighting some of our successes and some of our challenges in delivering that. So I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks very much.